Chapter 13, July 7, 1780. The sky all afternoon was hard blue. The sun beat down, and I feared for Miss Melindy in the heat, but she never complained. I could see that Johnny was tiring. The going was slow. Why don't you ride Grey Goose? I asked him. Don't want to be seen by the British. There are no British about. We don't know that. They could see us before we see them. We were lucky last time. How could I say she was lame if they spotted us and me riding her? Then I think we should stop early. It must be near three, and Miss Melindy is spent. Soon we find a good spot. He was absolutely demented about the place we camped. It must be just right. Near enough to a river or stream for water, but not out in the open. At least we'd be exposed. Yet it be a place not too overcome by brush, for we must have a fire. A little on a rise, he said, so we can sight anyone coming along. No gullies. Gullies are bad. You get trapped in them. Finally, he stopped, looked around, sniffed the air like a hound dog, and took us to a sharp left, away from the river. For a bit, we wandered through low, sandy inclines, not even respectable enough to be called hills, with lots of stunted pines. Then we came upon some spongy bogs. Clouds of gnats plagued us. Bullfrogs sent out their throaty greeting. It was getting darker. I minded, as I guided the mules behind Johnny. And then I realized that because of, of a sudden, we'd come into a forest of sorts. Then I heard it, gurgling water, a spring. Here, Johnny said, we camp here for the night. Know where we are? No, I said. About an hour's ride from Uncle Henry. Why can't we stop there for the night? I thought of Uncle Henry's elegant dining room, of servants laying a supper of cold meat, hot biscuits, relishes, cheese, tea. I thought of soft beds, thought of Uncle Henry's benign face. You know better than that. Why don't you stop on the way? Couldn't be sure British weren't about, and not enough time. Exactly. Besides, we don't want to compromise old Uncle Henry now, do we? What does he mean by that? I asked Miss Melindy as she and I were cooking supper. Johnny had taken his sling off and was washing Cephas down at the spring. Cephas was having the sweats. You want to know what I think? She asked. I think he don't want to see his uncle because the man be a Tory. And the British hurt him so he want to turn his face from anybody who like him. I looked at her startled. Even family? That's what I think, she said. But then what about Mama? She's a Tory and she's family. Will she turn his face from Mama? How you know she'd still be a Tory, came the answer. After days of cooking for that Popinjay and waiting on him and George Ann at table? I sank back on my heels by the fire. Oh, Miss Melindy, what will Johnny say when he finds Mama cooking for Rod on? You didn't tell him? No. Well, you best tell him before we gets home, or the sight of it might sprint him up to do something griev grievous awful to the Popinjay and bring the wrath of the rest of them down on us all. You contrived to tell him tonight, you hear? Yes. And then I had another thought. I'll have to tell him about Georgia Ann being smitten with Rod on, too, won't I? That would be wise, she allowed. But how can I do that? Johnny will never accept it. Some things he's gonna have to accept, she said. He won't, Miss Melindy, I said dismally. I know Johnny. I can't tell him. I'll have to lie. Hope you better align than you be at stirring them greens, girl. I brought my attention to my task. I have to lie, I said again. Yes, that's it. I'll tell him that Georgia Ann is being nice to Rod on, humoring him for daddy's sake. Ms. Melindy made a sound on her throat, humor or contempt, or both. And I'll get to Georgia Ann first thing when we get home, and tell her she's to lie to Johnny, too. What makes you think she's going to do it on your say-so? I'll tell her she must, or Johnny might kill Rod on on the spot. She'll do it. I know she will. She won't want anything to happen to her darling. Again, Ms. Melindy made that sound on her throat, and I knew it was contempt. Cephas was not faring well. He scarce ate supper, and his sweats turned to shakes. Ms. Melindy prepped a hot a pot of hot water and mixed some of her herbs. Don't want to be no trouble, he said to me as I handed him a cup of blended herbs. Cephas, when are you ever trouble? Don't let Johnny hear you talk such folderol. He'll be hurt sore. He drank the remedy. Good seeing you again, Miss Caroline. How things at home? Not good. Lots of servants love a Cornwallis. I told him the names. But Boney is keeping things running, and it looks as if we'll have a harvest, and enough people left to gather in the corn and grain. We're fortunate. On so many other, on so many smaller places, the men are gone and the widows have left home. And I'm afraid that this winter there will be want. We'll have to lend a hand, he said. Do him a good turn. Yes, I'm sure that can be managed, I said. Johnny went down to the riverbed and collected some stones, heated them in the fire, wrapped them in a blanket, and put them around Cephas to stop him from shaking. After a while, what with Miss Melindy's herbs and the warmth, Cephas fell asleep. It was dark, and the moon rose. Nightbirds called, cicadas chirped, bullfrogs spoke to one another in their creaking language, moths, or whatever they were, fluttered outside the circle of our firelight. Across the fire from me, Johnny sipped his mug of coffee and started talking to Miss Melindy, asking her about the condition of the crops at home. I wandered off to relieve myself of my water in the nearby woods. As I was coming back, I heard Johnny ask Miss Melindy about Cephas. Will he be all right? Right as rain once we get him home. 
he's dear to me, Johnny said. There was another change in him then. Never before the war would he have come out and said such. And I don't think that he would have said it if he knew I'd been listening. He stood by me in that prison compound in Charleston. He worked as a manservant in the officer's quarters and made friends with one disgruntled young officer who helped us escape. I couldn't have done without him, Miss Melindy. He's a good boy, she said. No, you must know. I must tell you. Tell someone. He offered to take my whipping for me. He said it was on his account that I knocked the officer down. I can't forget that. Their voices dropped lower then, and I couldn't hear what else was being said. I didn't want to, I suppose. I'd heard enough. Johnny, I need to talk to you. You should be sleeping, Caroline. It was late. The moon was high. Overhead in the night sky, stars sparkled. I saw Orion, the great hunter with his bow. Johnny, there's something you should know before we get home. He nodded. I told him about Mom and how she was cooking for Rodon and waiting on the table. I was the only Rodon would agree to let us come fetch him. I'm liking this less and less, Caroline, he said. There's more, Johnny. I want to tell it all before we get home. Georgia Ann has supper every night with Rodon. He insists on it. What do you mean he insists on it? He doesn't like to die in alone. The lie came easy, slipping off my tongue. I hoped I was better at lying than at certain greens. Lots better. She humors him to help save Daddy. How much? The words came distinctly and carefully across the fire of light. Does she humor him? She charms him, talks with him, listens to him. She can't abide doing it, but she told me she decided it would keep peace in the house while he was there. And it is harmless. It might help save Daddy. My voice trailed off. I did not know if he believed me. Johnny was smart. Paddleball Indian smart. Is there anything else I should know? Yes, one more thing. We haven't told Georgia Ann that you're a rebel now. Mama and I, the fewer people who know, the better. Being that Georgia Ann subs with Rodden and all. You are a dear thing, almost sister of mine, he said. Now you'd best get some sleep. I did so. I lay down next to Ms. Melindy. She was snoring. Johnny sat up by the fire, his musket in his hands. What had he meant by that last remark? The thought I had before drifting off was that Johnny was smart enough not to let me know if he did not believe me. I dozed and dreamed of home. I saw Mama cooking in the kitchen, Georgia Ann fussing with herself before the mirror in our chamber. I heard Daddy's voice in a distant room, heard his laughter, so I ran through all the rooms downstairs to find him. Rodon had secured his release from prison, but I went from room to room and there was no Daddy, only Mama, talking to me in her low, reassuring tones and the crackling sound of a fire. I was in the kitchen again with Mama. She was telling me Daddy wasn't there for coming home. They were going to ship him south to Charleston, and then to the West Indies. Just like your real mama, the sleigh was shipped out. She was saying, oh, it's God's punishment on us for what we did to your mama. Can you forgive us, Caroline? Then, before I could answer, she was saying, but I'll find your daddy. I'll look for him, and look for him until I find him. Then there was a hand on my shoulder, and I woke to find Ms. Melindy leaning over me with a finger to the, in front of her lips. She gestured to the fire. There, standing next to Johnny, was a woman. A young woman with a shawl wrapped around her. Her hair hung disheveled around her shoulders. The first thing I noticed about her was that her clothing had once been elegant. She even wore stiff stays. Her lawn apron was besmudged with dirt. The skirt of the holland gown was tattered and muddy. There was a small tuft of ribbon in her hair, half done. Her shoes had high heels, now worn down. Hers had been the voice I heard in my dream, not Mama's. It was she who had said, I'll find him, I'll look for him, and look for him until I find him. And she had some sort of accent. I'm afraid he's far off by now, Johnny was saying. Who is she? I whispered to Miss Melindy. Looks like Mevy, that Scotch woman from Gosclaw, who come round to a home looking for Cornwells. Did you see her at home? No. Boney tell me about her. Boney says she was with Cornwells in Charleston. She looks all ragged and spent. Boney says she got malaria fevers. Why? She struggled to her feet. I helped her. You stay here, she told me. What are you going to do, Miss Melindy? You hush and go back to sleep and stay here. I'm going to give her some remedies like I give Cephas. I lay back down, watching her make her way around the fire to where Johnny and the woman was still engaged in low conversation. The night had chilled, as it sometimes does when you are near the river. I huddled under my blanket. The three of them were talking now in those low, conspirational tones. I fell asleep again, their voices lulling me.